I'm in Lawrence, South Carolina at Fox Pike Farms. I'm speaking with Reed Edwards. Reed, you have a horse farm here and you want to have the best quality pastures for your horses and then you also have hay production as well. So let's talk about how you man what's growing in the pastures and how you manage it to keep it um, growing vigorously for the horses. Okay. To so what I'm trying to do, Amanda, is to have something green and growing all the time for my horses. And horse pastures are notorious for horses overgrazing an area, eating it down to where there's almost nothing, and then leaving tall, overmature uh, forage elsewhere. So I'm using a, a strip grazing concept. So I only give the horses a small amount of ground at any one time, and they're on that strip of grass for one, two, three days. My, my target is two days. Uh, you put a lot of animals on that area, graze the whole thing down, then move them on to another area and you let that strip have time to grow back. So you get a uniform cutting, so to speak. You do, yes. So, so you bring it down to four, five, six inches, something where you've still got leaf on the plant because the leaf is the solar panel that lets the plant really come back quickly. So they haven't scalped the pasture. Correct. How do you move them and, and fence them in? So there's an exterior fence that is uh, electric wire, and then I use a single strand of poly wire running across the field with a step-in post. Uh, so a few minutes every day, you run a new strip of uh, wire. Um, I will move my water trough. A lot of times I use the water to move the animals um, because there's still forage in the strip where they are. So they're not dying to leave. There's still food there. Um, but you might, particularly in the summer, you move the water trough ahead of time and then they get a little thirsty so then they look for water and they'll move following the water. So you don't necessarily have to go in and t take each horse and put a lead on him and move him no, over? No, it's it typically you're just pulling back the last 20 feet of fence, opening up a gap and the horses will And go they're right pretty through. well behaved. That's all you need to keep them separated. Yes. Um, the, the electric is a very effective, um, now you do have to keep the power on it all the time um, because they can walk right under it otherwise but uh, no problems keeping them in otherwise. What are the mixes or blends that you have in the pastures? So I've got um, a mixture of warm season and cool season grasses, Bermuda and fescue. The problem with fescue is we have a toxic uh, tall fescue in this part of the world that survives well um, because of the fungus that lives inside the fescue plant. And that's the endophyte problem that, that is, they that's talk the, about? That is, that's the toxic endophyte problem. It gives the plant good properties in surviving our hot summers mm -hmm. uh, because fescue is a cool season plant. It is also toxic, however, to our livestock that eat that. Um, estimates are between a billion and two billion dollars a year in the south to livestock operations. So the fungus that's protecting the plant unfortunately produces compounds that are harmful to the animals. Yes ma'am. Okay, uh, and so how are you getting around that? So I am transitioning my farm over to a novel endophyte tall fescue. Um, there are fescues that have no endophyte, they have no problems for the grazing livestock, but they don't persist very uh -huh. well um, because the endophyte does give protection to the plant. Uh, there are novel endophytes, so they have removed the endophyte or fungus, put in a different fungus that gives the plant the beneficial properties in survival, but not the toxic properties to the, to the animal. And then what are other, the other grasses and feeds that you have in? Uh, so then I also have an annual uh, field that is a mixture, about a 10-way mixture of, uh, you know, a lot of times folks are calling it a cover crop now. Uh, so, you know, one or two grasses, um, two or three legumes, and also some brassicas in there. So for my winter mix in the winter field, uh, there is oats and wheat, uh, ryegrass, and then crimson clover, winter peas, uh, turnips, radishes, and rape. And horses like that? Horses will eat all of that, yes ma'am. And so they're not, they don't have to just have grass? No, not just grass, and the clovers, the legumes are actually a higher quality feed, so you give a little bit more quality in there. And it's also nice to be able to go out and pick the greens and have fresh greens for supper every night. And then here we are going into the fall and we're in Bermuda grass, but we've got some other things that are coming up in this pasture. Right, so this is primarily a hay field. This is a Bermuda grass hay field that has had alfalfa overseeded into it. Uh, so it's an alfalfa Bermuda mixture. Uh, that's actually what I'm sitting on here on the, the hay bale. Um, so this is baled for hay. It'll be grazed some over the winter. So this is one of this, so this is primarily for hay. This is primarily for hay. It is a grazing tolerant variety of alfalfa, so I will graze it some over the winter when the, the weather is too cool to make hay. Then you've got a new 
hay that you're growing that's completely novel to me. Yes, uh, and that is Cerecia lespediza. It's actually an old plant that was very common in this area up until about the 50s or the 60s. Uh, Cerecia lespediza is a legume. It's a warm season legume, so it uh, pulls its own nitrogen in from the air. It also has the wonderful property of being a dewormer for sheep and goats. And let's talk a little bit about why, now that we've got a lot of people who are hobby farmers or mm -hmm. small farmers who are adding those to their farm plan and they're running into problems with a worm that's in the soil. Right, the, uh, the, the small ruminants, sheep and goats primarily, the barber pole worm, uh, Humuncus contortus, is very resistant to our chemical dewormers and is very harmful, uh, even deadly, to the sheep and the goats. And so how does the Cerisa play into this game? It reduces the fecal egg counts almost immediately on sheep and goats. It also protects against coccidia. Um, Cerisia has condensed tannins inside the forage and that is what has the action against the, uh, the worms. They don't know exactly how it works just yet, but it is very effective against them. And it's real easy to grow. It is. It will tolerate you know, poor quality, low pH soil, which we have a lot of in this part of the world, and where alfalfa, a lot of times we don't have the fertility to grow. Cerecia will grow just about anywhere. In fact, they put it on the sides of road banks when they have graded a new road, and they've taken all the topsoil away, and yet Cerecia will still grow there. So I know that goats will probably eat it up and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. What do other animals, will they eat it as well? They really do. It seems to be, as far as hay usage, it is the preferred hay over everything I have found. Even for your horses? Even for my horses. Uh, and sometimes the horses will eat that before they'll eat sweet feet. So uh, very, very palatable hay. Well, Reed, I have enjoyed learning about someone who is staying current with all the research and new ways of doing things to, um, to keep a farm profitable and healthy for the animals. I want to thank you for letting us visit with you. If people want to know more about your processes mm -hmm. here, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Either uh, by phone at 864-871-2575 or by email, Reed E or E E D E at foxpipefarm.com. Thank you for explaining all this to me today. Sure thing. Thanks for coming, Amanda.